we have a really exciting topic today. We're going to be talking about single cell epigenomics. Single cell approaches are extremely popular nowadays, kind of at the cutting edge of science. And we've got a fantastic speaker joining us today. So you guys are in for a real treat. So our first speaker, if you've been to an ARIMA webinar, we, you know we like to set the stage, give you some background. And our first speaker is going to be Anthony Schmidt, who is the SVP of science here at ARIMA Genomics. Anthony, we're very excited to have you here, and the floor is yours. Great. Well, yeah, thank you all for coming. Uh, it's always great to see um, attendees who are, I guess, new to 3D genomics, new to you know high C technologies, new to ARIMA, ARIMA webinars, uh, and I'm delighted today to provide a short uh, introduction um, for Dr. Tian, who's going to be talking about uh, a very, very cool line of research, very, very exciting research into single cell epigenomics, single cell 3D genomics. Um, and really the purpose of my talk uh, really here is just to set the stage. And I try to just give a brief introduction to who we are at ARIMA, uh, what we mean by 3D genomics, and what are some of the underlying technologies and use cases for 3D genomics, and hopefully uh, that provides a nice initial foundation um, uh, to be followed then by Dr. Uh, Tian, who will dive into much more details. So that's what I'll be doing today. I'll talk a little bit about 3D genomics, the technology, and the use cases, really starting um, with bulk you know, 3D genomics and then going down into single cell. So by 3D genomics, what do we mean by that? Um, if, you, if you've attended these webinars, um, you know, before, or if you're, or if you're, um, you know, familiar with 3D genomics, this will be already known to you. But I always set the stage by saying, uh, well, first on the left, the conventional way of thinking about, you know, genomics, I think, is going to your, you know, WashU genome browser or your UCSC genome browser or your or your favorite browser, and that often depicts the genome as a linear thread of A's, T's, C's, and G's, and um, by sort of contrast to 3D genomics, we call that linear genomics, uh, which is on the which is on the left side of the screen here. And then on the right, um, this nice you know icon here actually shows what the DNA uh, looks like uh, within cells. It it lives in a three dimensional you know context, and the genome has to function in that three dimensional context. And so by by 3D genomics, we mean uh, sequencing-based approaches to capture the three-dimensional structure of chromosomes and of genomes. And in doing so, we say we pro it, it provides both the underlying sequence information of the genome, but also the three-dimensional structure of the genome. And that three-dimensional structure has some really interesting and diverse uh, applications. And so we think that 3D genomics sits kind of at the center of this Venn diagram where on the lower left, uh, because it's a DNA sequencing-based methodology to measure the structure of the genome, it still provides an underlying sequence context, um, uh, which is obviously really important for uh, the measurements of DNA methylation, which we're going to talk about later. It's also quite valuable for identifying structural variants uh, in, in genomes such as cancer genomes, um, and that obviously has a lot of important implications in identifying drivers of cancer, um, things like gene fusions that can be therapeutically targetable or are diagnostic or prognostic in nature. And then lastly, on the lower right, uh, how these you know, methods were originally developed was to uh, kind of identify 3D interactions in the genome and ultimately how that relates to genome function and gene expression. Uh, so things like promoter enhancer communication and other types of, you know, regulatory interactions. And really, that's what we're going to be talking about today. So um, out of this sort of swath of different applications here, we're going to be focused more on the more on the regulation side and, and the insights that can be gained from, um, from profiling the 3D genome. So like I said, uh, I'll, I'll just start with some higher level um, introductory slides. Really, you know, I see 3D genomics as fitting into this, you know, genomics toolbox of different approaches. It's not, you know, 
the single solution, right? Uh, it, it, of course, fits in a toolbox with other epigenomics approaches like DNA methylation sequencing, attack sequencing, chip seek, transcriptomics, genomics. And the 3D genomics really provides that layer to understand how genes are regulated over a long distance, this sort of long, long range gene regulation. And so a typical experimental design, whether you're looking across different tissues or within a tissue or before treatment, after treatment, all, all sorts of different um, healthy and disease um, treated and untreated type of contexts, it's pretty common to pair something like transcriptomics, which will provide some insight into gene expression or differential expression, epigenomics, I mean, maybe you're you know looking for differential chromatin states or um, differential uh, methylated regions, and then 3D genomics with with you know high C types of approaches, which in in this sort of trifecta of approaches provides that long range information about you know long range gene regulation, you know chromatin contacts that may um, provide a structural framework for gene expression, and together we think that provides a comprehensive understanding of gene regulation, and uh, kind of under the umbrella of 3D genomics, one such approach. Uh, is a is an approach called HiC, uh, which stands for high throughput chromatin confirmation capture. And kind of a few of the of the subcategories or the the types of analyses that that we think you can do under the umbrella of you know HiC technology uh, are shown here. So on the far left, 3D genome architecture. Um, what that really means, I guess, in this presentation is bulk analyses of the 3D genome, uh, genome-wide, so not targeted, and across all different scales of genome organization. And I'm talking about from territories to compartments to topological domains down to individual chromatin loops. Then in the center, uh, this is really sort of a nod to um, approaches that specifically enrich for promoter enhancer communication. And I have one, just one slide on that to kind of talk about the concept and the, and the underlying technology to do that type of enrichment, uh, which is in a bulk context. And then on the far right, um, we're talking about single cell multiomics. And in this case, the multiomics are the 3D genome and the methylome from individual single cells, which is the approach that Dr. Tian uh, used. So I'm gonna give a short introduction uh, to that technology and just one example from the literature of uh, how that's been applied. So to start, we'll start with bulk 3D genome architecture here. And like I said before, uh, if you're not familiar with 3D architecture or you know 3D genomics, um, it's been known for a long time that there's different sort of hierarchical scales of genome organization from uh, on the far left, these much larger structures, like if you look at an interphase nucleus, you'll see that chromosomes organize themselves into chromosome uh, territory. So that's kind of like a spatial feature of genome organization at kind of like the most macro level. And if you zoom into individual chromosomes, you'll start to see other organizational principles uh, of the genome. One of these is called compartments, which in brief is just sort of the association of active, like large active domains in the genome and how they organize uh, together in space, and then the co-association of inactive regions in the genome. And as you progressively move in and you move from left to right on my screen, you'll see uh, sort of other um, sort of finer structural uh, features like topological domains, which are more or less kind of on the megabase scale. And then as, as you zoom sort of further in onto the sort of kilobase scale, or, um, tens of uh, kilobases or hundreds of kilobases, individual chromatin loops, which are sort of shown here, which can be kind of cinched together by architectural proteins like CTCF and cohesin and bring together regulatory elements, uh, which help facilitate gene, gene control or gene expression. And I just have one slide here if you're not familiar with the underlying uh, technology. So for the genome-wide bulk um, high C for 3D, uh, architecture analysis, we have quite a variety of different validated sample types. If any of these kind of fit your research requirements from blood to frozen tissues to cell lines, and probably the most recent one was FFP tissues, uh, which has now been available um, for, for a couple of years now. And there's really just 
three core steps, I think, to understand kind of how this 5C technology preserves information about um, the 3D genome. And so what we're looking at over here on the left is, let's say two pieces of DNA that are held together in three-dimensional space um, within a cell. The first step is you fix that DNA with formaldehyde. So if you're doing assays like you know chip sequencing, it's pretty similar to that. And then the first step is you just cut the genome. Uh, here we use a cocktail of restriction enzymes to fragment the DNA at these spots here. And then in this next step, you add a biotin uh, marker to the ends of those fragmented DNAs and then you ligate the DNA back together. And really sort of in this core step is you've, you've preserved information about which two pieces of DNA were spatially proximal to each other within the nucleus, right? So that sort of captures uh, spatial proximity and, and in doing so, uh, you know, kind of informs what the structure of DNA must have been inside that cell. And so once you've done this digestion and, and re-ligation event, you just purify your DNA um, here. And once you have the DNA purified, uh, then you can jump back up to the library preparation step where you fragment these, these molecules, build a short read uh, library, perform short read sequencing, and then data analysis on the back end to identify those architectural features like compartments, uh, tabs, and loops. And the data is often depicted in these um, square high C uh, heat maps. And so what we're looking at here is a karyotypically normal uh, genome-wide high C heat map. And you'll see that the chromosomes are organized along the y-axis, I'm um, sorry, along the x, uh, yeah, as row, or as columns and as rows. Uh, and uh, the first thing that will probably jump out to you is that there's the strong red signal along the diagonal. Uh, of that, and that red signal uh, corresponds to how many reads were observed between any two regions of the genome. And so if you had a uh, cross-linking and a ligation event between two pieces on of a, you know chromosome one that came together, then that would end up as a little red dot in this box. And if it was between chromosome one and let's say four, it would end up as a little red dot in this box. And the predominant signal that you see when you look at these genome-wide high C heat maps, um, at least in you know mammals and other species, is a strong intrachromosomal signal, uh, and that's really re reflecting the architectural property of you know chromosome territories. Is uh, chromosomes organize themselves in territories, and they're highly self-interactive, and they don't interact with other chromosomes as frequently, and that's why the red signal is much weaker in the interchromosomal space compared to the intrachromosomal space, right? There's very, very infrequent interaction between different chromosomes, but it does exist. And the beauty I think is then being able to go from that really large scale. And if I sort of zoom in to an individual locus of a few, few hundred kilobases, you can appreciate these finer resolution structures like, uh, like uh, chromatin loops. And so what we're seeing here is about a 700 kilobase region along chromosome two. Uh, this diagonal represents the linear genome. And then everything off the diagonal would be pairwise interactions between you know, regions within this uh, 700 kilobase locus. And to help kind of go from a visual high C heat map uh, at this scale, which I think Dr. Tan will probably show you know, some of these to some conceptual understanding of how chromatin might be folding in vivo within cells. I'm going to put four, four dots on this high C heat map. And there's this really strong signal that you'll see a high frequent interaction between the purple dot and the green dot. And to think about how that might look in vivo or how, you know, chromatin might be folding in vivo, let's just lay this out as a linear thread. And then the the prediction would be that that the purple and the green would be sort of cinched together, interacting with each other, and then the gray and the blue uh, would also be cinched together, interacting with each other. And so you might expect some type of a chromatin, you know, folding pattern uh, like this. This would just be an example where the green and the purple are sort of pinched together and extruding out a chromatin loop, as well as the green, the um, gray and the blue. 
So hopefully this gets a sort of an understanding of what the data looks like at these different scales and how it can be interpreted, where if, if the gray and the blue or the green and the purple were cis uh, regulatory elements, that would provide some information about the contact frequency between cis regulatory elements in the genome. Now I said that I was just gonna have one slide on promoter enhancer interactions. Um, and so that's what I'll that's what I'll show next is really up till now, I've shown bulk genome-wide IC analysis where you're measuring pairwise interactions between all different you know, combinations of pairs across the entire genome, which is really you know, powerful for measuring all those different scales of genome organization, which all have their own sort of impact on gene expression. But you can enrich, you can enrich for uh, promoter enhancer interactions by, by doing this. Um, once you have your HiC library, this is the same slide that I showed you before, uh, except now I have shown capture probes that have hybridized two promoters. So not every molecule in the HiC library contains a promoter sequence, but we have off the shelf where we can do custom probe sets, which hybridize two promoters and then pulls all the promoter containing fragments out of the final HiC library so that you sequence only the molecules that contain a promoter interaction. So, you know, this could be a promoter here, and it could be interacting with any other sequence in the genome, such as other cis, cis regulatory elements. So it's a really nice way to enrich for promoter-centered interactions without having to sequence the entire genome, if that's appropriate for your research. Last but certainly not least, uh, just a few minutes here on single cell 3D genomics. Uh, and I want to start by just showing um, the workflow. And, and you know, uh, first I want to point out that this method was first published back in 2019, back to back by Joe Ecker and Bing, Bing Ren's lab. You can see those on the bottom. And really, like kind of like how it's different than bulk, uh, you know, 3D genomics. Well, it actually starts out very similar, where within cells or within nuclei, uh, as you see here, those same kind of core steps or core, you know, principles um, happen where you digest the genome with a cocktail of restriction enzymes and you ligate the DNA back together. So this happens within intact nuclei, um, as, shown, as shown here. And so you've already preserved information about the 3D genome within these intact nuclei uh, at this stage. And then you sort individual nuclei into individual wells of a plate. So it's one nucleus per well in a 384 well plate. And then once you have one nucleus per well on a plate, you can purify the DNA, bisulfite convert the DNA, and then build individual single cell methylome libraries in each well of each plate. And so in doing so, you'll have sequencing reads that contain information about the 3D genome. So there'll be these sort of light ligation junction reads. And then you also have reads that contain information about uh, DNA methylation. And so from each single cell, you have a measurement of the 3D genome and the, um, and the methylene. And just one example, I think, uh, I, I really like this. This was from a couple of years ago from Joe Ecker's lab, where they uh, performed um, single nucleus uh, methyl high C sequencing in the mouse hippocampus. And the first thing I'll show you is that if you if you just cluster cells based on the 3D genome signal alone, you can sort of readily identify these different major cell types within the mouse hippocampus, which I guess is sort of expected because if each cell type has its own um, sort of 3D genome folding patterns, then they should be distinguishable when you, uh, you know, cluster these different cells uh, from the mouse campus, and indeed that's the that's the case. And so, what you can then sort of do is sort of dig into uh, those cell type specific chromatin loops for each of those major cell types. So each of these dark red sort the of bars in this heat map is a cell type specific loop, and there was about ten thousand of those across the mouse campus. So quite a bit of cell type specificity uh, when it comes to chromatin looping across these different cell types. And then the last example I'll, I'll just talk about is there's these two different regions um, in the mouse hippocampus sort of 
at the top of the schematic is the cornus ammonis region or the CA1 region. And then a little bit further uh, down below that is the dentate gyrus region. And if you look at these pseudo bulk uh, IC heat maps that have been resolved from the single cell analysis, um, and you look at the CA1 uh, cells, there's this gene that is a marker gene of CA1 cells called FOXP1. Uh, it's called the language gene because uh, mutations in this gene are associated with speech disabilities. And in the CA1 cells where that gene is expressed, it shows these long range chromatin looping events here uh, and here. And these correspond to DNA hypomethylated regions. However, if you look at the DG cells where FOXP1 is not expressed, you don't see that strong looping pattern and these regions are hypermethylated. So, you know, kind of stepping through identifying cell types, identifying cell type specific chromatin loops, and then correlating that to the underlying methylomes and, you know, gene expression uh, data really does kind of help provide that sort of more, you know, comprehensive understanding of gene expression you know, in this case, in the mouse campus. Really, since we've um, launched uh, these kits that enable this, we've had a few different publications, just showing here a couple of the Atlas papers from the Ecker Lab. And this one here is what Dr. Chan will talk about, as well as a recent publication in science uh, from Long Chi Tan and others at Stanford. At, uh, Stanford. And I'll just end by saying, if you're interested in this technology, uh, bulk or single cell, um, be happy to reach out and discuss kits as well as our service you know, offerings for this. And in summary, I, I really believe that 3D genomics data helps address really a broad variety of questions. And I've really tried to show here some examples in the context of gene regulation, both in a healthy and disease context. And there's really genome-wide and targeted approaches to consider as well as bulk and single cell approaches to consider when you're thinking about um, integrating 3D genomics into your research. And with that, I will, uh, I think, turn it back. Uh, thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Anthony. That was a fantastic introduction. Um, thank you for setting the stage for our guest speaker, Dr. Wei Tian from the Salk Institute. Um, I'm going to introduce our guest speaker. Uh, Dr. Tian is a computational biologist with expertise in deciphering intricate biological processes through algorithmic innovations and software development. He got his PhD at the University of Illinois at Chicago, where he pioneered algorithms for predicting and characterizing protein structures. Um, at his research at the Salk Institute, Wei focused on analyzing and developing methods for single cell omics data, particularly in epigenetics, transcriptomics, and spatial omics, and has contributed significantly to the Single Cell Human Brain Atlas, which is a really cool, incredible project. And his current research interests lie in unraveling the complexities of the brain, exploring aspects of aging, and understanding diseases through diverse single cell omics data. Very impressive. We're so excited that you're here with us, Wei, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. It's really my pleasure to share with you uh, our research on the, using the, the single cell epigenomics approach to study the, the brains. Um, <clears throat> well, we know that the, the brain probably is uh, the most uh, uh, complex organ uh, in, in, in uh, at least on this earth, and uh, yeah, and it has uh, this amazing uh, intelligence. And uh, actually, underlying uh, this uh, intelligence, there's uh, uh, cellular uh, infrastructures like uh, different cell types uh, there to for the brain to function in this uh, very uh, amazing way. And uh, to uh, so basically to understand the the, the brain uh, the mechanism of a brain or the gene regulation or the brain functions, we need to um, uh, understand the the. Uh, this uh, cell types here and also uh, the gene regulation of this cell type. So uh, in um, Acrolab, uh, uh, what we are interested in, uh, uh, how we address uh, the, the complexity of the, the brain cell is uh, using the single nucleus epigenomics method to study the, the, the either the cell type or the gene regulation. Uh, I believe that Anthony has already um, covered very well about this part. 
uh, I won't go into detail, but basically our uh, interest in is uh, in um, particular in the DNA isolation and also the chromatin conformation, uh, on like uh, so, uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, or the, the 3D genome. So basically, it's a, a DNA isolation can give you uh, basically the the uh, 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 gene regulation information at base level uh, about how, uh, for example, if uh, the the uh, certain region is uh, for certain gene is uh, um, isolated, then uh, it's uh, uh, then uh, it's uh, uh, it, uh, repressed a gene, or in uh, the uh, cis regulus for element of that gene, if it's uh, 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 mass isolated, then it's also repressed. And also the the three D genome give you a more high uh, a high level uh, interaction of the chromatin. So in our study, basically we use this method uh, to uh, um, uh, profile the. Uh, Single cell uh, genomics uh, from a lot of uh, brain regions. So basically, we cover the uh, forty six different uh, forty six different brain regions from uh, seven major uh, brain structures like uh, basal nucleus, thalamus, uh, basal forebrain, uh, hippocampus, uh, midbrain, uh, uh, cerebellum, pons, and also uh, a lot of parts from the the cerebral cortex. And uh, uh, basically, we use uh, the uh, samples uh, from uh, three donors, and uh, we construct uh, this uh, adult uh, single cell um, uh, brain, a uh, single cell brain atlas. So what we use, uh, 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 Anthony already covered, is uh, called. Uh, uh, we use uh, two different um, uh, assay to uh, do this. One is uh, the SNM cystic, uh, basically is a, a single cell DNA isolation profiling. Mm -hmm. Uh, based on the uh, basophy, uh, convert, basophy conversion. And another one is called snm 3 c It's a co assay include both the uh, DNA methylation information and also the high C information, the, the, the long, long distance contact between the chromatin. <clears throat> With uh, this two assay, basically, we can get a lot of information, like the, the methylation level. Uh, along the genome, uh, we uh, categorize, categorize the methylation in two different uh, in two different categories uh, based on the um, the the the, the uh, sequence. Uh, I think it's a well studied one is the the uh, CG methylation. Basically, is uh, the, the 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 methylation on the CPG site, CPG by nucleotide. And another one is uh, for the all the other uh, cytosine contact like uh, uh, CA, CT, or whatever uh, different. Than and CG, we call it a CH methylation. So both uh, can give you the uh, regulatory uh, information of the of the cell, and also like this kind of a uh, high level uh, interaction of the chromatin. Okay. So with uh, um, this uh, um, uh, methylation and also high C information of each cell, we can uh, cluster the cell and do the annotation and have a, a, a construct a, a taxonomy of the human brain cells. For the region we uh, studied, basically we can uh, the 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 brain cells can fall into three uh, different category uh, or the the cl uh, cell classes. One is a cephalic excitatory neuron, basically the excitatory neuron from the cortex and the uh, hippocampus. And the other uh, major part is the inhibitory neuron and also the non uh, cortical neuron. And the, the 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 other one is uh, the non neuronal cell. Basically, is uh, the like the the uh, uh, um, cell uh, form the the the, the uh, molecular and also like all the other glia cell who provide the support to the neuron cells. And you can see we we determine the forty uh, major type uh, from the brain, and uh, this can be further uh, clustered into about. Uh, a uh, hundred different uh, cell types, uh, sub subtypes in the brain. So you can see there's a really high complexity here, which need uh, uh, this uh, can, um, uh, single cell epigenomics uh, uh, data to understand the gene regulation of the cell. And also, we uh, uh, because our data is from the DNA isolation and the uh, 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 3D genome alone, and we want to compare with the other modality to see if they are there's a consistency between them. So we did the integration between DNA isolation uh, data and also the, the RNA data from our collaborator, 
um, uh, Stan Linderson and also the the uh, and also the attack single cell attack uh, data from uh, from uh, Bing Ren's lab. And so you can see basically uh, the cell type of the consistency is very well across the different modality. And also even the uh, a subtle difference like the the regional difference of, of, of regional difference of brain cells are also uh, integrated very well. So basically, the cell type we determine the uh, consistency across modality, and all this data set can help us to understand how gene regulates in the in the brain cells. Okay, so uh, how do we use our data to understand this? Uh, we already covered a little bit how this methylation can give you some information. For example. We uh, um, by measure the uh, gene body methylation, uh, we can determine the differentially methylated gene. We'll call it DMG here uh, in both uh, the the CH either the CH category or CG category. So this methylation information actually has a, a, a correlation with the gene expression and actually anti-correlation with the gene expression. So basically, you can see if this is a low, um, low, uh, hypomethylated gene, you know, they will tend to have a, a higher gene expression. So this can tell you the gene expression level, kind of like a, a, a proxy for that. And also, uh, we can. Uh, for the whole genome, we can, we can uh, identify the differentially methylated region. Basically, this is a, a, a de novo detection on, on the genome. It doesn't uh, matter if it uh, has a, any gene annotation or not. And uh, this part can also give you a lot of uh, a hypomethylated region, which is uh, an indication this uh, either is uh, currently a, a regulatory element, like an enhancer, or it is uh, functioned as an enhancer in the past, probably during the development. And uh, by using this kind of information, uh, you can uh, get a lot of cool uh, uh, idea of uh, the cell. Uh, for example, by uh, using this, uh, by combining these two information, uh, you can do a motif, a motif enrichment study, and you can find which um, transcription factor is uh, uh, is uh, probably the, the key factor in a certain kind of uh, uh, cell type. We do that for um, uh, all the uh, major cell type, and we can even uh, to uh, go uh, go a far resolution to see in the subtype level if there is a, a, a specificity of a certain um, transcription factor uh, to to the to the subtype. And also beside that, we also um, can, because we have this uh, 3D coma, uh, uh, genome information, so we can detect the uh, differential loops, uh, basically the, uh, the strong contact in a certain kind of cell type, but not the other cell type. For example, here, uh, uh, you can see this is, this is a very dark dot here, the, the indicate the loop here in this cell type, but not this, this cell type. By all this uh, integrate all this kind of information all together, we can identify the candidate enhancer and also the the, the their uh, target genes. So um, basically, uh, compare uh, uh, compare uh, all this kind of information. We identify the uh, over three million uh, regulatory element and uh, gene pairs, and between the about one million uh, cis regulatory element and uh, uh, twelve k genes. And uh, here is an uh, uh, heat map to show you some example of uh, the 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 DMR, uh, the the methylation level of a DMR and the, the of a gene and the gene expression level and the loop contact. You can see they show uh, a pretty good uh, correlation or anti-correlation between them, and which can tell you the 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 uh, the gene uh, the gene regulation functions. So by using actually this is uh, quite useful because uh, for a lot you can see here actually a lot of uh, this uh, enhancer is a cell type specific and this specificity can be has been proved to be uh, to be used a good tool to target a, a specific uh, cell type and uh, that's quite useful. And beside that, this kind of information can also help us to understand the, the, the gene regulation of a certain uh, cell type. For example, uh, this uh, 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 SYT1 uh, gene, uh, or uh, it's a, it's a, they encode the, the, the protein called the septotagmin, which is a master uh, switch for the uh, releasing of a neurotransmitter in the brain. And, but uh, there's a huge difference between the uh, this uh, expression level of this SY, uh, SYT1 uh, gene in uh, cortex or basal ganglia. 
And the, the reason that we can, uh, now with our data, we can understand that the, here, this is an example can, you can see here. Uh, at this point, basically, is uh, the, the, the promoter of uh, the, the, this uh, gene. And uh, uh, you can see uh, in the, uh, this, uh, this um, uh, cortical cell, major cell type, there's a lot of interaction between this the promoter of this gene with the, uh, with the distal uh, regulatory element, but it's not in this uh, major basal ganglia cell types. And also, if you check the, the uh, DNA methylation levels, and you can see this the contact, the, the contact anchors as a high pole methylation in uh, the, the first cell type, not the second one. And this actually explains why you have a higher expression in the in the brain uh, in the in the cortex uh, than the uh, basal ganglia another thing is uh, very interesting uh, can, can help uh, this data can help us uh, uh, to understand the, the the brain disorders and uh, how they associate with cell type we know we have already accumulated a lot of uh, GWAS uh, studies uh, and data uh, from the past many years and uh, we know that is all, all this a lot of uh, of this uh, risk variant detected actually overlap with this uh, uh, the uh, enhancer or cis regular element. And uh, by compare our uh, uh, cis regular element uh, candidate with this kind of thing, we can link the, the this uh, 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 link the, uh, this uh, cell type to different uh, uh, brain disorders. So for example, here you can see uh, basically, uh, 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 microglia is a pop up, it's a link associated with. Uh, um, uh, Alzheimer's disease, and I think that's a very a hot topic right now. And also, you can see the major type uh, from basal ganglia is related to like the the, the tobacco use disorder and also the uh, ADHD uh, uh, disease. Okay, yeah. So so basically, you can see uh, how can we understand the the, the uh, cell type association with uh, brain disorder in a high. Um, uh, high level, and uh, we can also dive into it to, to see how each uh, risk uh, variant uh, associated with a certain kind of cell type, and we can actually see a diverse implication of this uh, risk variant. If we take uh, schizophrenia as an example, you can see here the, uh, there's a risk variant here, and uh, in the both the the, the uh, uh, upper layer neurons and the lower layer neurons, it has a, a similar uh, implication to this different neuron type. But uh, here in this example, basically another risk variant seems to only affect the, the upper layer neuron instead of the, the, the um, uh, lower layer neuron. And you can see very strong interaction between this uh, risk variant with the promoter, uh, promoter region. And also you can see the correspondence and methylation change uh, as this uh, 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 candidate enhancer site. Okay, so this is a lot of things we can uh, learn based on this uh, 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 cis-regulatory element and the, the, the target gene pairs. And uh, we can uh, also know a lot uh, uh, other things like the, the, the uh, regional heterogeneity of the brain. We found that actually uh, many years ago in uh, our uh, um, mouse brain study. So basically in the cortex region, we found uh, in the mouse cortex, we found that the, the excitatory neuron actually they show a very strong uh, regional heterogeneity. Uh, this uh, basically is not uh, not uh, in a, uh, not only uh, in a layer wise, but also in a spatial wise. You can see that for different uh, uh, gene, it has a different uh, methylation pattern uh, gradient or gradient in uh, in these uh, different uh, brain regions. And uh, we actually, based on our uh, clustering analysis, uh, based on this uh, UMAP here of this, uh, how this single cell uh, similar to each other. And we can also see that uh, this is uh, the UMAP and the, the color is uh, the, the dissection region. For example, you can see the excitatory neuron, like this uh, layer two, three excitatory neuron has this very strong regional difference. And uh, for uh, some other things, you can still notice, maybe not as profound as this one, but you can still notice that. And about uh, uh, in the uh, inhibitor neuron, for example, the VIP neuron, lamp 5 neuron, it's hard to say if it's a, a, a regional heterogeneity there or not. And uh, uh, we, we try to uh, uh, answer this question, but a uh, uh, um, confounding factor here is that uh, in additional to the regional uh, heterogeneity, there's a lot of, uh, you can see based on this uh, UMAP uh, shape, there's a lot of uh, uh, subtype there. This is actually the confounding factor. You don't know what you'll find if you just uh, do a simple 
analysis that you don't know what you'll find is uh, from the, 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 the uh, subtype difference or the original difference. So we develop a, a framework actually can extract, uh, 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 remove those uh, confounding factor and extract uh, the original uh, axis here, or actually it's, uh, as, uh, the method is very general. You can uh, apply to whatever the condition you are interested in. The condition here in our case is original information. So I won't uh, cover the detail here, but uh, basically is, uh, by, from this uh, a very messy one, we can get a, a very clear regional access from the mes methylation data. And uh, uh, surprisingly, uh, you can see uh, by applying this to all the cortical neurons, uh, we see a very strong access, uh, not only in the uh, excitatory neuron, but in the inhibitory neuron, we also see the same uh, access, uh, regional access. And also this uh, original access is uh, consistent among all the uh, cortical cell types. So basically, uh, by using this method, we discover a uh, uh, regional axis from the posterior to uh, uh, medial and anterior, and then to the left, uh, so, sorry, to the uh, lateral anterior and uh, to the medial anterior. And uh, we also apply this method to the uh, basal ganglia and also find uh, the, another axis uh, from the vertical to dorsal to lateral uh, axis uh, in the basal ganglia. And uh, probably if you're interested, you can check out our paper. So with this axis, actually, you can get us uh, the study of the original heterogeneity. We've actually found that uh, the, the both the gene methylation and also the gene suppression can have a certain kind of a gradient along this axis. And uh, uh, here is just a, a straightforward example to see this uh, monotonic change along this axis. Some gene uh, methylation and suppression uh, increase along this one or the other decrease along this one. But we can have a, a more complicated pattern along this, uh, for this original heterogeneity. And uh, here is an, another example uh, about uh, the gene called NR2F1, or it has another name called a COP, uh, COP, uh, TF, uh, COP TF2, uh, co sorry, COP TF1. And this is a, a very uh, uh, important uh, t uh, transcription factor, uh, especially during the early development of the, of the brain. It actually, uh, in the new cortex, it actually uh, set up the the the, the uh, region regionalization of the um, uh, visual cortex and the motor cortex and also somatosensory cortex and also it also set up the, the boundary between the uh, new cortex and also the anterior cortex. The, the knockout study show that uh, if you, uh, there's a disruption of uh, this uh, region regionalization in the brain during the development. And uh, uh, in this part, basically, you can see uh, this gene is uh, is suppressed uh, in the uh, uh, very uh, uh, posterior part of the brain, the visual cortex, and also very the uh, front part of the brain, like the uh, anterior anterior cortex. And uh, you can see the is, uh, the gene is fashioned in there, but it, uh, about the, at, at both end. But if you look at uh, the uh, gene regulation by looking at the, the uh, either the three D genome or the DNA isolation, you can see a very amazing thing. So basically. Although this uh, gene is expressed uh, in, in a different region of the brain, but it actually used uh, the, the different um, uh, uh, regular regu regulating program. Uh, for example, in the visual cortex here, you can see basically the uh, the cell are using this kind of domain and has a, a very uh, like crazy uh, loop uh, here, a lot of loop here to interact uh, between the different kind of uh, uh, enhancer and the, the gene promoter of the gene at this point. And uh, but uh, in the anterior cortex, it's also expressed the gene, but uh, it doesn't use this domain. It's a start to use uh, the other domain to do this kind of uh, regulation thing. And uh, this is the three D genome data. And if you zoom in, you can see the correspondence change in the DNA methylation. For example, in the in the in this uh, in the domain one, you can see the uh, D uh, gene methylation DNA methylation is a uh, um, it's a decreasing from uh, 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 visual cortex to so the renal cortex. But in this part, it's increasing. This is a con con uh, con consistent with uh, the, this uh, 3D genome study. So basically, you, can, uh, you cannot tell this kind of mechanism by only look at the gene expression. So that's why we think this is really helpful uh, to, to understand the brain. And uh, uh, yeah, so I try to be quick. <laughs> Yeah, and another thing that we find is uh, also a very interesting one is uh, we derived a single cell methylation uh, barcode 
for each cell because during our study we find a lot of uh, CPG uh, dinucleotide it has a very specific DNA methylation for example they probably uh, like all methylated in the other um, uh, completely methylated in the other uh, cell type except, except this one and this one and this one for different uh, uh, CPG size and for this one basically it's uh, completely uh, unmethylated in all the other cell type but uh, completely methylated in this one so this is uh, given uh, give us an idea to construct a, a easier way to uh, determine a cell type uh, so, and uh, using some uh, machine learning framework basically we extract uh, this kind of uh, a set of CPG side, we call it. Uh, it uh, looks like a barcode from anything so you you buy from you you buy from the, the supermarket, and basically by examining um, uh, the the DM, uh, the status of uh, uh, DNA methylation of a single cell, and then compared to this reference, you can very accurately determine uh, the cell type in a single cell level, and uh, also this is very robust. Uh, you can use uh, the data construct from different donor and apply to another one, there's no problem. The accuracy is actually is very high. And um, uh, you also don't need to use all the CPG side here. We determine a lot. Of, uh, we determine a lot of CPG side, but uh, actually in in practice, you only need uh, like uh, about two hundred. You can determine two hundred CPG side. You can determine a cell type in single cell level very uh, accurately. Yeah, so uh, I only cover a little bit of our finding in uh, in, in, in our research, and uh, this has been published in the, the, the last year uh, in science. And if you are interested, in, uh, you are welcome to check out uh, our paper, and I think you can find more uh, exciting uh, results. Yeah, and uh, uh, I would like to, for this uh, project, I would like to acknowledge uh, the 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 old. Uh, People from the Acre Lab and also our collaborator, uh, 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 Magas Lab in also in SOC, they provide us uh, a lot of help with the uh, uh, dissection of the brain and also uh, interpret the biology. And uh, in our study, the, the we have a collaboration with uh, the Bing Ren's lab and also Linerson's lab to share the data like the single cell RNA seq and the uh, taxic. And also the the uh, Allen Institute uh, provide us the, the sample donor and also provide uh, the biological interpretation of this thing. And uh, that's all from my side. And thank you. Thank you for the attention. Thank you very much, Wei. Wow. That is so much effort. I was just looking as you were talking through all the acknowledgements, just all the work that went into um, into your research, all the people, all the players. Um, that's really, truly fantastic, really inspiring. With that, uh, let's jump into the Q&A. Here was one question that we got from one of the registrants. And the question is, what are the advantages of using single cell epigenetic techniques to study a neuronal differentiation? I mean, I guess, You've really been talking about it this whole this whole webinar, but if maybe if you want to highlight um, some of the most important takeaways, that would be helpful. Yeah, I um, think I can I can I can start answering this question. The question is, uh, yeah, it, uh, so what are the advantages of using single cell epigenetics to study the neural differentiation? I think the the the, the key part is uh, uh, to under uh, is a, is a, uh, I think there are two parts. One is uh, epigen epigenetics, and the other one is a single cell. So uh, basically, because uh, during the Diamantal, I think the, the, we also have a similar project. And uh, actually, we see that the, uh, the change of the cell is, uh, is uh, very rapid, actually. It uh, it's, uh, has a certain kind of a jump things if you uh, uh, think about the, the cell identity from like a, a, a progenitor cell to a certain kind of a cell type in a certain stage and then get a much more mature than, than before. And so without, I don't think um, without the single cell, you can see, because uh, if you use a box, there will be a mix of a lot of uh, rapidly changing things. So basically, uh, um, that will be uh, very hard, or I, I, I won't say <laughs> impossible, but definitely very hard to dissect the, the, the true signal during this uh, developmental uh, process. Um, or probably you can only find some common one shared by the all different uh, cell populations. And another thing is uh, the, the single cell part. Uh, uh, sorry, the, the epigenetic part. Actually, we found that uh, during the developmental, there's a, a, a very drastic change. And you can imagine that very, very drastic change in, for example, the DNA methylation and also the uh, 
chromatic conformation, like the, the new how the new domain form and also how a, a large domain in the pre, 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 uh, uh, previous stage is uh, there, but in the next stage it's a split or melting to uh, uh, subdomains and uh, to only to uh, to specialize for certain kind of a regulation. So. <laughs> So as an, some example show in the talk, if you don't use epigenetics part, uh, probably you'll miss this very amazing uh, events happen there. Yeah. Thank you, Wei, thank you. Um, let's go back to the Q&A uh, because I see quite a few questions. Again, upvote the questions that you guys like. I'm gonna start with this, this first upvoted question from Jason. Uh, how much DNA can you get from each nuclei? Is it enough for library and sequencing, or do you need to do WGA whole genome? Um, so I think the question was like, how much do you, how much DNA do you get after you purify the DNA after the um, hook in the first step? Uh, I don't, I don't recall the detail. Probably you can check our uh, paper, but I think it's uh, in, uh, in our uh, SNM uh, three. Uh, Yep. Sorry, SNM3C or SNM, uh, uh, SNMC seq they are always a kind of a uh, uh, whole gene. Uh, there's no bias uh, in in the in the uh, DNA uh, uh, in the in the DNA coverage. So it's a kind of like a, a WGA for the single cell level. Yeah, yeah, and uh, and definitely uh, it's a, it's a, it's enough for a library uh, and for library and sequencing. I think. Um, Based on our experience, uh, uh, basically we can get like uh, in uh, for DNA isolation, we, um, we can get like uh, 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 five percent to ten percent genome coverage for each single nuclear. And uh, when you do the analysis, uh, you can either using the sing, uh, single cell information or merge them together as a pseudo bulk cell type specific uh, track to use those uh, to do the analysis. Okay, um, another question. Thank you, amazing talk. Have you tried single cell M-code for brain tumor cell origin mapping using the normal brain developmental reference? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. <laughs> we haven't tried that yet. And so we are now trying to expand it to the uh, whole body uh, of the human, and uh, but uh, we haven't to try on uh, different uh, like disease. There's so but much. I think more that's, that a, that's a good do. idea to do that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's fantastic. Okay, a question from Audrey. The atlas that you published, mice and human, are neuron enriched. Do you plan to do a glial enriched version to study other diseases tar targeting OPCs, oligos, astros, etc.? I think for the uh, BI, uh, B, uh, Brain Initiative founded one, like the BICCN at the previous stage, or the BIC and BICN at the current stage, uh, mostly uh, this effort are towards a, a, a neuron. It's a basically neuron enriched. I don't think within this network, I don't think uh, there's uh, too many group working on glia part, but definitely there are parallel uh, study. For example, there's uh, some, Work in our in our group. We we haven't published yet, but it's more uh, towards the, the the glial cells. Yeah. Okay. Here's a, just an upvoted question from Robo. In bulk I see resolution remains an obstacle to detect whole genome enhancer promoter interactions because the depth of sequencing required is very important. How much enhancer promoter interactions should one expect in the combined high C methylome data set at a single cell level? Uh, I think that's a that's a that's a good question. Actually, is uh, the you can see if the the genome coverage is like a five percent to ten percent, then the the basically the this is one D. Then if you look at the the three D, basically that will be like uh, about uh, about one percent coverage of uh, all the possible uh, contact. And uh, uh, I. I don't uh, check the I, I don't recall the exact number, but uh, uh, but to uh, conquer this uh, sparse uh, sparsity in the data, we have uh, uh, I think there's a lot of software out there can do that. For example, in our lab, we develop a uh, 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 colleagues of uh, uh, colleagues uh, 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 Jin Tian Zhou, he developed a, a method called SC High Cluster. Basically, can the, based on the uh, uh, single cell high C data to do the imputation and uh, get a much 
uh, less noisier one. And uh, by combine those uh, data and can give you a good uh, uh, IC analysis. And also like the other uh, uh, tools like uh, Higashi or Snap, Snap IC can all, uh, I think, uh, to, uh, to attack this, uh, this problem. Yeah. Thank you, Ray. Um, so we have just about two minutes left before we wrap this up. So I'm gonna ask the panelists to choose any question that they would like to answer, just take a quick look at um, the still remaining questions and find your favorite one um, and uh, go ahead and answer it. Please read it first. I'll go first because I think there's only one here for me, uh, sure. which is the first one from uh, Maye. Actually, the slide that was just on the screen uh, showed the single nucleus methyl 3C seq uh, workflow from sample of the library. The ARIMA kit does the first half of that. So it includes the reagents to do the, uh, the high C part. It does not include the reagents uh, to do the single nucleus um, uh, methylation uh, library prep. However, the whole, the service that we offer, uh, you know, does the whole thing from sample all the way to, um, you know, sequencing. Thank you. Wei, what's your favorite question here out of the remaining one? Uh, <laughs> yeah, pro probably I'll answer this one, the question from uh, TASFA. Uh, can you explain the role your study finding, your study findings for diagnosis and the treatment of uh, patients with severe mental disease like schizophrenia, depression, and so on? Yeah, so I think our um, study is a kind of, uh, it's, a, it's a still very uh, fundamental. Uh, it's a kind of far from uh, the, the clinical uh, study, but I think this comp our, our data set, the data set we generate provide a reference uh, for this kind of study. If you want to, uh, for example, as I showed, if you want to study the uh, how each uh, um, risk variant will affect a certain gene expression. You, you can check our data and uh, to find easy if there's an clue. And another thing, so probably is uh, also promise, uh, promising is uh, the the, uh, the barcode approach. Um, basically, in our barcode approach, we can use uh, uh, only uh, uh, a handful of CPG sites. We can determine the the where the, what kind of, what detail cell type this is this and the very uh, probably various uh, come from. And so we, we know that so there are a lot of uh, study uh, study right now using the uh, cell-free DNA to do the diagnosis part. And uh, there's a lot of research shown that uh, like the Parkinson disease, Alzheimer disease, this kind of neurodegenerative disease, it, uh, certain certain uh, situation, this uh, they're also, they can release the cell-free DNA and uh, get penetrated the, 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 the brain uh, blood barrier. And uh, if we can detect uh, this kind of thing and uh, the barcode approach could be a way to do this kind of a diagnosis for this certain kind of a brain disease. Thank you, Wei. Thank you. Um, thank you, Anthony, as well. So again, thank you all for attending, for the engaging Q&A. Thank you to our speakers for some fantastic talks. Really excited to see um, where you take this research further. I'm sure you already have a lot of great things that you're working on. Again, thank you all and have a great rest of your Tuesday uh, afternoon, evening. Bye. Thank you.